Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Matthew Taylor. I'm Chief Executive with the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here for this evening's special event, which we're delighted to be staging in partnership with Crown Agents Foundation. Uh, before we begin, can you please make sure your mobile phone is switched to uh, silent? We're filming tonight and live streaming over the web, so welcome to everyone watching online. And a reminder that the hashtag is uh, tech for good if you'd like to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. Now, as that hashtag suggests, tonight our discussion focuses on the question of how best to fulfill the humanitarian promise of rapid advances in technological innovation. Uh, there is, it's estimated, currently an almost $100 billion annual shortfall in funding for essential infrastructure in Africa. And the risks of delivering aid to some of the most remote and fragile communities remains great. So could drones and other robotics provide an answer to some of these most persistent humanitarian and development challenges? We've brought together an expert group of speakers this evening to help tackle this question, understand this potential for us. We're going to hear first from the former Africa correspondent at The Economist and director of the Future Technology Initiative, Afrotech, Jonathan Ledyard. Jonathan's vision is one where drones are transformed into agents of hope, revolutionizing essential cargo deliveries in African cities suffering from critical infrastructure deficits. Then we're delighted to be joined by Tamara Giltsoff, head of innovation at the Department for International Development, whose ambition is to bring tech innovation into the day-to-day -day leadership and delivery of UK aid. And finally, we'll be joined by Mary Staunton, chair of Crown Agents, to issue a challenge to innovators to show that the market for new tech understands the development problems it wants to solve. And of course, as always at RSA events, there'll be time to take your comments and questions. And I know from having looked through the audience list that we've got a specially engaged and expert group of people joining us this evening. Uh, including those people joining us online. So we're very much looking forward to your contribution to the debate. So, without further ado, let's get started. Please welcome, first of all, Jonathan Ledyard. Um, thank you so much uh, for coming. Um, I, I want to just talk very broadly uh, about some of the trends which are happening in Africa right now and then segue into the drones and obviously in the discussion we'll talk in more detail about that particular technology. Um, all of my work is uh, focused on the equatorial part of the planet so I think it's very useful just to make a couple of simple points uh, about that part of the world. Obviously this is the part of the world where the population uh, is growing the fastest. Um, it's also the part of the world which doesn't have any winter. Uh, day, daylight hours are, are more or less the same uh, throughout the year. And generally it has two rainy seasons. So in this part of the world, uh, rain and mud, uh, and then on the other hand, drought and dust are, are the uh, perpetual <coughs> constants. Um, as uh, Matthew mentioned, uh, I have a very unusual uh, uh, way into engineering and advanced technology because my whole career was with The Economist uh, uh, newspaper and I was a foreign correspondent and a, a war correspondent for The Economist for most of my career and for the last decade I was the Africa uh, correspondent and I, along with my colleagues I wrote this cover story a few years ago uh, and, and that really captures where Africa is right now. It's on the way up. Uh, everything is changing, incredibly dynamic. Um, this uh, is one of my favorite pictures. We took this picture in northern Kenya uh, a while back. Uh, we're not so much into basketball in the UK, so you may not recognize that the very tall gentleman is Yao Ming, who is an NBA uh, player who's Chinese and he came to northern Kenya uh, to this little primary school to campaign for Chinese people not to buy elephant ivory. He's a very nice chap. But I love the picture because it expresses something very profound about where Africa is right now. There is a young China, it's giant, it's by far the most dynamic player in Africa at the moment 
and Africa, even younger. And this is one of the very primary points to get across in our discussion tonight is not only is advanced technology going to happen, but China will be by far the leading country in that. And if we talk about drones and robotics in particular, then uh, China will uh, be leading that. Um, very quickly, uh, this is, um, you can just see these little tents here. This, this is a picture of Nairobi in the year 1904. Nairobi now has four million people. Uh, by the time I retire, it will be up to six, seven million people. Uh, so when I use the word warp speed, it really is uh, very, very fast, the transition which is happening. Uh, and when we talk about populations uh, uh, having over 50% of young people under the age of 18, you're very bright people and you can kind of grasp that intellectually, but just have a look at these faces here. There's going to be 80-90% youth unemployment. Uh, over 70% of these young people will never have a salary job in their life. So uh, we don't need to be a political analyst to realize that the near future is quite combustible. Um, these are the gunmen. Uh, I, I like to go to Somalia, and these are my gunmen who are guarding me in Somalia. This guy is on Facebook. Um, <laughs> So even in a very, very broken down society, uh, advanced technology uh, penetrates very, very quickly. And people who are very skeptical about the ability of technology to scale should just uh, reflect on that. And, and this is the reason that I'm standing here today. This is the Nokia 1100 phone. This is one of the great design inventions uh, of the late 20th century. Uh, and prove that you could get very advanced technology down to a very, very low price point. And it's known as the Kalashnikov of communications. <laughs> this is my lab. Uh, this, these are some of our partners. In, in, in London, uh, we have uh, Imperial College yeah, uh, and a few other partners. Um, and this is, uh, I'm just skipping very fast because we have a lot. Uh, of, uh, to discuss. Uh, this is kind of the vision. Uh, don't look at this picture from an engineering point of view. Uh, but really, this is the, the core vision for a cargo drone. So uh, we can talk about drones for uh, other uses, but uh, really I'm, I'm very interested in drones to carry stuff. I think it's possible to, to build very cheap cargo drones uh, which can carry motorbike loads at motorbike prices. And in many uh, places in Africa in particular, but also in Southeast Asia, maybe parts of Latin America, this could be a really profound technology. Uh, this might be Ethiopia. Uh, you might have a town of 40,000 people here, another 40,000 people here. There is a road. It's probably tarmac now, uh, but there's no bridges no tunnels, uh, and, and there, there is not that much road. And as Matthew rightly pointed out, the public infrastructure spending gap is locked in. This is a really, so the young people are coming, they're not gonna have jobs, there is no money to build even a Turkish or Iranian scale infrastructure. That's not gonna happen. So we need to think in different ways. Uh, and this is the idea that we had, and uh, in order to achieve it in the next five years, we've got three goals. Firstly, you have to make it legal, so you have to prove that it's safe, secure, can be done. Secondly, you need to get a low-cost drone, which will look a little bit like a, a Volkswagen Beetle, um, which falls in love with a Star Wars fighter. And, and they have a love child, the love child will be the cargo drone. Um, and then you need a, a, a secure place to uh, uh, land and operate the drones, the drone port. That's what we've been working on a lot. This is the first use case, uh, was shipping uh, blood um, in Rwanda. Uh, there's a very big problem without going into all the details, but HIV AIDS 
meant that there was a lot of money to clean up blood banks in Africa. And that was very successful. So blood now is very, very clean, but it's quite centralized. So if you, God forbid, were in a car crash in Africa, you're going to get clean blood if blood is available, but most likely you're going to get no blood because blood doesn't travel around very, very well. So our idea was from a central clinic to fly blood uh, to outlying clinics uh, on an emergency basis. And in particular to save lives of very young children who uh, suffer from malaria in particular uh, and they need blood transfusions. We started really thinking through the robotics and the engineering of the drones. Um, basically, you're going to end up with a VTOL craft, so vertical takeoff to about 200 meters and then shoots off like a plane. It's very quiet, very, very fast. Um, and this is the sort of size that we're up to at the moment, uh, which is, well, actually, we're a bit bigger now. We're about four, four and a half meter wingspan. But we'll end up with six to seven meter wingspan craft. Uh, and it's really important that the human factor is central to the development of this technology. Uh, many of us in the room uh, have had uh, you know, family events ruined by someone flying a drone around. <laughs> really, really annoying. So these craft have to be very, very uh, quiet, very safe, and actually quite beautiful in order for them to be uh, accepted by large parts of the population. Uh, this is a startup that uh, I introduced to the government of Rwanda. Uh, called Zipline. They raised about $30 million um, in Silicon Valley from uh, Jerry Yang and other big Silicon Valley investors. And they are actually now uh, already flying blood. This is the delivery of blood. So the drone flies and over the clinic it drops the payload with a little parachute. Um, so they're going to be doing that for the next two years and they're moving out into multiple <coughs> markets in Africa. Um, this, again, is uh, the vision for a drone port, uh, which is quite, we didn't realize at the beginning, but it's quite a political vision. It's basically saying, as with early railway stations in, you know, if you're in Northamptonshire in the 1840s, you get your first railway station in Northampton, it's a private company that built it, but it's kind of a public undertaking. And we feel like drone ports should be like that. We just don't want an Amazon warehouse on the edge of town. We, it's very important for all the reasons I suggested about unemployment that um, the technology is accessible to the community and it's providing local jobs, local value, and obviously reaches the price point uh, which is useful for them. This is on Lake Kivu, looking out towards uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, so right on the edge of Rwanda. And this is the land that the government of Rwanda has given us to build the first drone port uh, in the world. Um, the government <coughs> and the president are very supportive, and they're going to co-finance the first three uh, drone ports. Uh, uh, admittedly, some of that money will be coming from the British government uh, one way or another through uh, direct budget support, but it's very, very positive. Um, this is the, I, I love this, only people who are interested in architecture would like this, because uh, uh, otherwise it would be unintelligible. But this is the first sketch that uh, my friend Norman Foster, uh, Lord Foster, uh, made uh, on the drone port. Uh, so we, we, we met about two years ago and he has been working with our team for the last two years. I went to him and I said, uh, Norman, you've built the largest airport in the world in Beijing. Now please come and build the smallest airport. Um, and the idea was to use very, very cheap materials. Basically our, our economic uh, cut-off point was to price the drone port at about the same price as a petrol station in the same town. So 
uh, a little bit less than 200,000 euros uh, for, a, for a drone port, which is a really tough ask, and to make it a civic building. And this is what we came up with. Uh, this is made of compacted earth tiles, which is very labor intensive to build, but that's a good thing. Uh, very, very cheap. The middle bit is um, a 3D uh, fab lab, what kind of garage of the 21st century. The operations are here, quite secure. And then all of the community engagement is at this end of the building. And we built, actually, just to prove the concept, uh, we built this section in the Venice Biennale this year, um, uh, which was really fun. Um, and obviously there's a clinic interface. Uh, this is the operations room. This is how one of the drones will look. Um, yeah, this is my big claim. And this is where we uh, can have our discussion. Uh, by 2030, most small towns in most poor countries will have a drone port. That's, that's my big claim. Uh, we're at the beginning of the railway era. Obviously, it's never going to be as powerful and important as railways. The simple physics uh, uh, will always counter that. Uh, but it will be a significant uh, add to the economy. And here's another point, which is uh, something to discuss. Uh, it's kind of counterintuitive when you have so much um, uh, unemployment. Um, uh, but I think that robotics uh, can buy you things that you would not otherwise have. Um, if you're so poor, in Britain, robotics is going to be very politically uh, uh, challenging. Um, it's really going to affect our labor force. But in very poor countries, uh, where you don't have an industrial base, uh, you're just getting extra efficiency. Uh, that was the Venice uh, project. And this is my last slide, which uh, is one of my favorite engravings of all time. This is the Liverpool uh, Manchester Railway. This, by the way, cost 230 million pounds to build uh, in, in modern uh, money. So it was a really big punt in those days. Uh, and uh, I really envisage uh, cargo drones as being kind of railway line in the sky. So this is just a few uh, pointers to kick us off. Thank you. Sorry, are there any empty, can anyone, is anyone sitting next to an empty seat? Aha, there, there's some back there, so a couple over there if you want to go and find them. And I think that one in the front row can be taken by one of you if you want to. <laughs> okay, tomorrow over to you. Okay. Um, hello, uh, thank you for, for having me here to, to talk about this, this interesting subject matter. I am... Um, relatively new to DFID, I'm seven months into my role, and rather unusually, I haven't worked in government before. I've come from 20 years working in the private sector, and most recently I was involved in a technology startup uh, that was in the Internet of Things sector, um, or area, <coughs> and we were building a software platform to connect remotely to batteries in sub-Saharan Africa to monitor the health of those batteries and anticipate in advance when they were failing. Um, my interest in so-called frontier technologies or emerging dis technologies or game-changing technologies as we framed it today is not so much the technology itself but the business model around the technology that emerges <coughs> enabled by that technology. In the case of the application of Internet of Things in the distributed energy sector has meant that we can now offer people access to distributed energy on a pay-as-you-go basis over two to three year payment plans, which was just not possible before having the, the ability to connect remotely to these devices. Many people in DFID recognise that we need to keep ahead of the game in terms of tracking the emergence and the use case of technologies like drones and other uh, technologies like the Internet of Things. And we're doing a very good job of uh, I think, of investing in uh, the, the use of those technologies and trialling those technologies. 
my work at DFID is really to support the piloting of those technologies, how we can get the use case for them, how the business model will emerge that will be relevant to the work that we're doing and how we solve the problems um, in the process of doing that. I think with drones, we're in really early stages of that um, exploration, which is going to take a while, and we don't quite yet see <laughs> the business model, uh, if I may, uh, 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 you know, whether it will be about um, solving an um, emergency issue or delivering blood, or whether it will be about delivering um, e-commerce solutions and um, Amazon deliveries to very remote, hard-to-reach areas. The jewelry is out, so we're very much in experimentation phase. Um, we re recently launched a program called Frontier Technology Live Streaming at DFID, specifically to do uh, what I've just described, which is to um, identify emerging technologies, match make them with uh, our colleagues who work on the ground in the countries that we operate on, who are working on a daily basis with real issues that they're trying to solve, uh, with a background context of value for money, value for money, value for money, which is um, important when we're spending public money. Um, so we'll be matchmaking uh, frontier technologies with uh, real problems on the ground and designing uh, the support to pilot the use case of those technologies and measure the impact and look for opportunities to unlock the business model around it or unlock the opportunity to scale those technologies. I have some of my colleagues here today um, who will be um, available to talk to you uh, on a stand, I think, uh, in the drinks afterwards, so I urge you to do that. DFID has funded a couple of trials of, of, of drone use, and I've, you've touched on one with uh, Zipline. We recently had um, some coverage on our trials of drones um, in the BBC over Christmas, and very positive uh, coverage. Um, they, uh, what I know about them, and I haven't seen this, the work in, in action yet, but they're fixed-wing drones that release small packages attached to parachutes. Um, and they're focused on delivering uh, medical supplies and blood. Apparently they can travel 93 miles, uh, guided by GPS and battery-powered. Um, Zipline at the moment calculates that it's the same cost to do that delivery on the ground or using traditional means, whether that's motorbike or car, uh, as it is um, to deliver by drone. That will obviously change over time, and I think it's interesting that we've reached price parity at this early stage. That says something for me. Um, so I thought I'd just leave you with a couple of scenarios that I have uh, thought about in the last few days, thinking about this talk. And these are really scenarios, because I, I genuinely believe that we've got a lot of experimentation and piloting to do. Uh, and for us, uh, we're often working in very fragile states with a very difficult delicate situations going on, so we cannot throw technology at a problem without being really thoughtful about uh, how we work through the piloting of that technology. So here are my future scenarios to think about. Many of the roads and transport infrastructure in developing countries is outdated and in need of repair. Can we imagine a world where sensing, robotics and data analytics support infrastructure maintenance and planning at scale? What will the government department of the future look like to manage and fund these programs locally in those countries? Uh, agriculture in hard to reach remote and arid areas is challenging for growers and communities depending on, dependent on farming. Do we see a future for robotics and smallholder small farming? What would the business model look like for these farmers and how might we get that to scale? Disease outbreaks such as Ebola and Zika has got the better of us at times in developing countries and in emerging markets? Do we see a future where rapid disease mapping, utilising mobile technology or other technologies, and rapid targeting delivery of meds uh, is plausible? Natural disasters and conflict in isolated communities and immediately vulnerable people often needing, in need of medical supplies and blood uh, is, is something that we are faced with uh, on a regular basis, and climate change will uh, obviously elevate and increase that. How far off are we able to target people in impossible to reach areas under these conditions? And finally, my uh, example that I touched on earlier, uh, e-commerce, and in particular Amazon, 
has brought with it highly sophisticated and efficient supply chain operations. Do we imagine a world where e-commerce targeted at low-income communities living in remote rural locations or hard-to-reach areas in very high altitude, as example, will be possible? Thank you. And last but not least, Marie. Thank you. So Crown Agents is a social enterprise owned by a not-for-profit foundation working in international development. And that means we do difficult things in very difficult places. And so we use new technology, innovation. And 150 years ago, Jonathan, we were working on railways. Uh, and Crown Agents was laying track across India, across Africa, for steam locomotives to use the cutting edge fire burn boilers. Um, and the engineers were, of course, supported by the back room here. And nowadays, women aren't in the back room, they're in the front. Um, but we're still, yay, um, but we're still um, using new technology. So right now, we're using the new off-grid solar to bring light and electricity to 250,000 women, men, children across four continents. And it's exciting to think about bit chain, uh, bit pacer, being able to reduce the cost of emittances, to increase the transparency of funds. Um, but, uh, but it's also very interesting to think about big data helping with disease tracking, as, as you've suggested. But we all know that poverty isn't going to be defeated one app at a time. And with our experience, we're asking probing questions for our partners working with drones. And I wanted to share with you in the next few minutes what those three questions are, and then perhaps have a challenge, which I can throw out to people in this room, but also those listening right now in, in Harare, those listening in Washington, uh, and our colleagues in Sierra Leone. So the three questions that we ask are, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? Who's going to benefit from that solution? And who's going to control that solution? So if we look at first at humanitarian, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Well, this is Nepal. We were working there 2015 in the earthquake. And after a disaster, you need a very rapid assessment because you get to get the right stuff to the right place really fast. And so to do that, you triangulate an assessment. You use information from local communities, crowdsourced information from mobile phones, information from satellites, from NGOs, sending the expert up to stand on top of a hill and look round. And doing that, there was a good enough assessment within two days in Nepal. So what could drones add to that? Well, they would have a different view. They could go below the cloud cover. And sometimes in these villages, when, when houses collapsed vertically, you couldn't see the damage from above. That would be useful. But could you get drones hundreds of miles to remote villages. That would take very large and expensive drones, wouldn't it? And what would the Fikin survivors think when the drones arrived? How would they take them? And are there the skills there to use the data, to analyze that data, to triangulate it with everything else, and to do that really fast? Well, you know, perhaps we could. Perhaps if you're right, Jonathan, and there'll be a day where drones are as available and as familiar as taxis or as motorbikes, that day might come. Then in the development sector, could drones be used to map very difficult terrain to get a supply chain over? Or could they be used to give security to, say, medical stores? Uh, when we worked in the Ebola crisis, 
we got into Sierra Leone, two million kilos, wasn't it, Brian, of medical equipment. And to securitize that took tens of thousands of pounds every month. Would drones be cheaper? That would be useful. And you've already talked about the possible role of drones taking valuable but low weight cargoes such as blood. But our question is, is this affordable? How do we scale this? And would it really help the poorest? Because that's my next question. Always a key question in development is, who's going to benefit from this? So, once every four minutes, a woman dies of a hemorrhage in childbirth, postpartum hemorrhage. Now, if you're being treated in St. Thomas Hospital across the river, you're fine. They've got the equipment, they've got the blood, you're safe. But these women are not so lucky. In South Sudan, where we work, they were born into a poor country. And that country doesn't have a health system which can get the blood and get the oxytocin to them in time. And that's why South Sudan has one of the highest maternal mortality rates. So could drones be used to strengthen the health systems in the very poorest countries? Could they be used to decrease not increase inequalities, or would drones just be used for the rich elites and not for these women? Then the third question, who's going to control the solution? So you don't have to have seen that wonderful film, Eye in the Sky, to know that drones are being used for military purposes, and therefore they have an aura of what the stealth of sort of secrecy around them. So in order for them to be accepted by the civilian population, you've got to have some transparency. Now, Crown agents here and some of them in this room spend a lot of time explaining to governments, local and national government, that if your system is transparent, it's going to be cheaper, it's going to be more efficient. And in fact, that's why Stanford University has called our business model honesty for hire. That's what we do. But in the case of new technology, it's even more important if this technology is going to be accepted. It's going to have to be accepted at community level, at local government level, at national government level. And countries like Rwanda you were talking about is introducing regulation, regulation about safety, pilot licensing. Does it need to go further about who owns the data, how it's used? Um, and... What, that, what does that ownership mean like? What does that acceptance by the community mean? What does it look like? Well, it looks like this is uh, um, a chief I met recently in northern Zambia, Chief Zima Lumba. The older I get, the younger chief seems to be. Um, and he's, uh, you know, he's young. He's in his 20s. He's really forward-looking. He works with plan on girls' education, uh, early adopter, and acceptance by communities means that leaders like this could see that drones are making real practical difference to the lives and to the livelihoods of people in what is a very poor chiefdom. So then, and to do that, we clearly need more information, as you've been saying. We clearly need more test cases, more pilots. And therefore, what reaching out to partners and saying, can we investigate what is the job, the development job, the humanitarian job that drones can really do and can do now? And secondly, what regulation is going to be needed? And, and because if you don't have good regulation when you're introducing new technology, it can really go badly wrong, as we know. And thirdly, how do we get that public trust and acceptance? The challenge to all of you and those listening is, can you help in this? Thank you. Thank you, Mara. I quite like the kind of counterintuitive suggestion that when it comes to drones, we need more pilots. But, um, uh, Jonathan, before I invite people to make comments and ask questions in the room or through uh, 
or online. I'm just interested in your response. I mean, I, in a sense, thinking about the, the panel, you emphasise technological possibility. Tomorrow emphasised business models. And Marie emphasised the kind of broader system in which this change takes place. I'm interested in your responses to Tamara and Marie's points. I think they're very, very strong points. And I, I think that obviously drones um, have a very high bar to clear, uh, as a lot of advanced technologies do in the modern world. They have to be safe. Privacy concerns, I think, are very profound, as Marie said. Um, there's obviously, uh, as my friends in intelligence keep calling me up, uh, they're very, very worried about, you know, could you uh, create a beautiful uh, cargo drone which then can become a, a very cheap distributed uh, weapon? Uh, obviously, you know, that, that's a reality. But I'm afraid I take a much more cynical point of view, which is um, all forms of automated connectivity are going to carry a, a cost uh, in terms of intrusion, um, you know, algorithmic expansion of technology creates the ability for it to implode in, in, in sometimes violent ways. Um, but, you know, the connectivity is going to make uh, poorer countries safer. I mean, if you can push 3 to 5% of high value uh, transport uh, of goods into the sky, which I think is a very realistic uh, number, then that's probably going to add one point to GDP. And it's not going to save these countries, uh, but, but it's, it's uh, a new way of building infrastructure. Um, and you know, quite simply, if you can't prove any of the things, any of the concerns, then it's not going to happen. You know? But what my, my bigger worry is not, is it going to happen? I think it's definitely going to happen, and definitely uh, Chinese companies are almost there already, uh, as I've seen in my trips to China. Um, the, the bigger worry for me is, will it happen for poorer people? Or is it just for the oil and gas industry and, and a few safari camps and some very big agricultural ranches? Which goes to this business model point, I guess. Yeah, and, and I, you know, when I, when I first went to Africa for The Economist, um, was the very beginning of a uh, mobile phone era. And not to be too critical of Diffuge, but I feel like... They, She's only been there a few months. <laughs> <laughs> we all like but, to think that the place we've gone to was rubbish before we arrived. So, so. <laughs> but, it's getting better now. It's getting better now, of course. <laughs> yeah, new, new administrators. Um, but the, um, the, the, there was a lot of uh, scepticism on the part of the development community um, uh, at that point, and I feel uh, uh, that we could be taking a little bit, we could be moving a little bit faster because the reality, the economic and political and environmental stresses on these countries are moving very fast. So you, uh, you're thinking, sorry to put you on the spot so much and we will open up, but in terms of the balance of risk, the risk of not going ahead full steam is greater than the risk that some mistakes might be made as we go along the road. Yeah, I, I think that's true, and, and I think it's run like when you go into the casino and play roulette, and, and you know, most sensible people are putting on red and black or odd and even, but this is probably sort of 17 black, right? It's, the chance of it getting to massive scale is small because there's a lot of opponents, but if it comes off, it's very, very considerable. Um, uh, and we have plenty of uh, intelligent people thinking about existential risk um, and uh, you know, the possibilities of something extraordinary terrible happening. I think it's important also to have a space in technology to think of extraordinary things that can scale. You know? Great, thank you for that. So, oh yes, of course you can. <laughs> um, just something I've been thinking about as we're talking. The difference with um, mobile phone penetration and adoption is that mobile phone penetration and adoption happened quite uh, extensively in developed economies before it then happened extensively in emerging markets. And where we're at with um, drones and robotics is that we're all in the hype cycle. We're all in this early stage together and we 
all pretty much don't yet know what the business model for this will be. Um, so that's just sort of one reflection. And then my other reflection in terms of our conversation and even sitting here today, um, and with DFID's role in mind, was sort of talking about us elevating and us doing on to this market for drones. Um, and, and that might be that our role is to catalyze that financially, but it feels quite like uh, we need to launch the rocket from here um, somewhat. And I'm not suggesting that's right or wrong, it's more of an observation. Um, here we are suggesting that developing countries and the problems that they face need to adopt these technologies. Um, well, clearly they need to move stuff around. They absolutely need to move physical goods around faster, more accurately, and cheaper. And they can't do that if they don't have bridges or tunnels. No, I, and I fully agree with the problem. Um, I, I, I'm just uh, noting that we're a group of people sitting here talking about introducing technologies into a context, and it would be very valuable to be having this conversation in some of those country contexts and to be catalyzing the work for those countries. Because if we're talking about this being a new infrastructure for countries, that infrastructure needs to be owned, operated, business modeled by the countries that it operates Absolutely. in. Otherwise, it's an unsustainable model that the likes of DFID have to continue to fund. So it's sort of more a, a I just want to put that in the room versus a strong comment on it. And you'll be Br happy to know that, that right now there are groups of people sitting around listening to us about to have their own discussions uh, in Harare um, and in, in Freetown. So it, it isn't just happening here. Yeah. But I wonder if your problem is also the opportunity because development is listed with disasters of technology which has, has been developed in rich countries and then landed in developing countries where, and it is completely and utterly failed. So. Right, let's take some views from around the room or uh, online. I can't believe... Oh, yeah, very good. There's a gentleman. If you could wait for the microphone to come to you and tell us your name, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Very interesting discussion. My name's David Jamieson. I work for the Partnership for Supply Chain Management in, uh, in HIV and AIDS. So coming from a similar line to Jonathan. That, and uh, just a comment on what Tamara was saying. That I think the solutions will, and Marie, the solutions will generate in ways we don't yet appreciate from Africa. But I wanted really, my question was to Jonathan, one of the problems we have in the last mile of distribution is in the opposite direction of getting back from health centers um, blood samples for diagnosis. Do you see a role for drones with that? Can they collect and bring back to the center? You've, what the model you had was from a center going out. Can you go from the disparate points back to a, back to a single point, which in this case would be a laboratory? Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to cop out slightly, which is that I, I'm, I'm not a very big believer, it, it sounds a bit strange, but I'm not a big believer in drones on the last mile. It's true that they have an emergency healthcare uh, uh, operability, but I, I'm much more interested in drones on the middle mile. So you have a drone port connected to another drone port on a whole network of drone ports. <laughs> A, a, a country like Uganda might end up with 70, 80 drone ports. That's really town to town to town. Uh, and I, I'm, I think in the healthcare space you might see uh, send and return. But uh, in general, I, I, I think that last mile delivery is not optimal in, in, in where you know, young people have motorbikes and they can do those last eight, ten kilometers on the motorbike, uh, uh, probably at similar speed. Um. MSF have, uh, have done it with TB sputum in Papua New Guinea, uh, and they found by engaging the local community um, that that was an accepted thing to do. Uh, they found it was reliable. Um, in fact, a drone that that uh, got lost was, was, was brought back by the community, but there wasn't a cost comparator, so you just don't know what the business case would be for that. There's a gentleman at the back of the room. Uh, 
Yes, uh, I have a, an issue for the panel in terms of three, three th things that came up in terms of piloting, you mentioned development and control. In terms of development itself, with regard to areas of rural, with rural areas without any kind of infrastructure for such an advanced state of um, movement of blood or whatever the case might be, does the panel believe that this is the right approach to, to, um, to challenge this problem in terms of things like, uh, like the tsunami or what was mentioned in Sierra Leone in terms of Ebola? Is, is, is this um, technology of droning the right way forward in, to solve such a drastic problem? Okay. Um, uh, let, is there any, I might take group questions in groups. So there's a, I'll, if you remember that question, and then we'll take one here, and then I think we've got one online from Twitter as well. So. It's Mosariki, uh, it's working. Uh, it's Mosariki from the Gavi Vaccine Alliance. So we are, um, let's have a question, but more different perspective on the use of drones. We are the other partner, along with the UPS, in the Zipline project. And um, I think, just adding to the commentary here, um, one of the ways that we're starting to look at drones is, is very much taking a, a much more wider perspective, which is looking at those different use cases. So there's emergency use case and Zipline um, have been working quite, quite well to date on that, perspective, on that particular use case. Um, but what, what else is out there? And so I'm actually really interested in talking to you, Jonathan, about the different types of drones. But I think just to add the Gavi view, which is very much you know, representing, and thank you very much, Difford, for your support, but uh, representing 73 of the poorest countries of vaccine delivery, I think when you start to look at drones is as a component of the supply chain, um, and it may actually be in the last mile in some remote areas, or it may be um, in a much broader, you know, in the upper, much more upstream. But uh, we're really interested in actually finding out what is working, what is not working. And we know there's lots of work going in Madagascar, and Papua New Guinea with our partners too. Um, but if, if, you know, the, the point of the comment really, a perspective to see how is it that this is working and scale actually is gonna be the biggest driver. Really, how can this be scaled across 73 countries uh, where vaccine access is a, is a big, big issue? Thank you. And then I think this is a, a Twitter question. Yes, this, this question comes from the US. Um, what is the biggest obstacle to the use of drones at scale in development and what can be done to address that issue? Great. Why don't we go in kind of reverse order? Do you want to pick up, you don't have to pick up all of those points, but if there's anything you, want to, you do want to pick up. Yeah, the gentleman at the back, it's too early to say really. I mean, I absolutely take Jonathan's point that where, where's the money going to come to do traditional infrastructure, but the case is not yet made that, you know, the answer is drones, and I don't think anybody would say drones are the on, only answer anyway. Um, yeah. I'll take the barriers <laughs> and, and the, um, the potential solutions. Uh, um, I mean, I think there is a lot of talk around sort of sensitivity and regulation. Um, I don't think those barriers are unsurmountable. I think we can uh, address those barriers. I think that there are some barriers about where in the supply chain um, this uh, type of transportation sits and how is it linked to other things. And then just in response to that, I think this um, uh, idea of sort of integrated transportation, so transportation joining up with other forms of transportation to meet the last mile or drones um, being one part of a system of transportation. So we're moving to a world now where we won't necessarily all have our own cars. We're starting to move to a world where it's now easy to access a car on the street and share that car. And at some point, we'll move to a world where we don't have to drive cars and cars can connect us easily to trains, to other forms of transportation. So um, I think it's sometimes worth thinking about technologies uh, and their, um, their magic <laughs> when they meet other enabling technologies. So connected devices uh, and connected transportation um, coming together with drones. And so I think it, there's something there for me around where in the supply chain um, drones will play and do they always need to play all the way through or can they have a role in different components of that joining up with different forms of transportation? 
Um, yeah, what, what are the biggest challenges? I mean, I, on the regulatory side, obviously, it's a very weird space from an engineering point of view because you have aerospace industry. So we've worked a little bit with Airbus, and Airbus think they want to get into the cargo drone space. Um, but it's very, very, very hard for them. They're, they're sort of addicted to very large, expensive airframes. Uh, so they're very hard for them to move down. At the same time, on the robotics side, and you know, I always think of drones as just the first use case of cheap robots. So this is really important to think of drones as a robot, not as this entity or just of its own. So, so they're coming out of research labs at you know MIT and Imperial and, and ETH and so on. Um, they don't really know about uh, you know, how to test spare parts, how to create a super safe airframe. So there's kind of a little space on the engineering side in the middle uh, where we, we don't know how a safe airframe is going to look. Uh, and, and then you know, there are some regulatory hurdles, but uh, I think the biggest hurdle is simply human acceptance, as I, as I said in my opening remarks. Um, you have to pass your grandmother test, which is if you took your grandmother outside and she was a grumpy grandmother and you showed her in the sky and there was a stream of, of cargo drones going overhead uh, at four or 500 meter altitude, uh, would she be very unhappy or, or would she regard it like migratory geese? Um, <laughs> so I think if, if you get a neutral response, you're probably going to get to scale. Uh, but okay. if not, yeah. I think for my grandmother, it would all depend on whether there was a Bakewell tart <laughs> in any of them. But um, <laughs> it is possible, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I think we've got time for one more round of questions, uh, and then I'm going to cheekily ask a question of my own before we finish. There's a gentleman right at the back of the room there. Uh, Adam Boxer from Wessex Social Ventures. Um, we do work with like last mile. Uh, social businesses and the difference that the infrastructure and roads make to those communities is absolutely huge in my opinion from what I've seen. By replacing some of that with drone networks, do you not think that could have a negative effect on those communities? So does it reduce the incentive to, to do the other infrastructure work, I guess? Uh, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, John Adlam, Crown Agent. So I, I head up the uh, Humanitarian and Emergency Operations Support Service for DFID and the Stabilisation Unit. And my question is about the um, regulation. Uh, is there a regulatory model that the panel is aware of that can be rolled out? It seems to me that uh, that, that is one of the, the, the key elements here. The technology seems to uh, abounds both small and, and larger, not large yet, but we'll crack that. But how are we going to operate these things? Okay, and any others? Yes. Dr. Stephen Pryor from the University of Southampton, uh, redoing our manned air vehicles. Uh, a positive and a negative. Positive, um, you've got a great opportunity in this uh, part of the world uh, to actually build a complete new model, stemming from education and developing these systems. Um, a lot of people don't understand, but these systems are fairly inefficient. Um, there's a lot of knowledge that could be put into actually building new technologies from the base upwards. Um, and if you, if you see books like Diffusion of Innovation, you'll understand you can actually jump a complete genre in terms of moving from one, one stage to another. Negative, um, Amazon couldn't do their testing uh, because of regulation in the States. So they went to Australia. Um, where there was less regulation, and now they're operating in Cambridge in the UK. Um, why, why didn't they go to these kind of uh, countries to actually develop their systems? Presumably because the financial model didn't make sense, or they could make more money somewhere else. So that's the negative side. Great, thank you. So those questions, uh, panel, and then just one finally for me, which is we, we've talked almost exclusively about drones tonight, so I'm just going to ask you because it's great to have such expertise in the panel. If you had to choose another technology, a different technology, which you think has the most potential in relation to development, uh, tell us what you think uh, that is. Um, let's start with you, Tomorrow. 
Um, do I get to choose which question I ask? Yeah, but you have to answer mine. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm the chair and it's my house. <laughs> um, I'll take the one on um, the, uh, the sort of replacing out the, the, the demand for keeping roads um, and maintaining roads. Um, I guess the jury's out. That we're, with the adoption of a new technology, there's always sort of trade-offs and does that mean the end of work overnight and um, does that mean the end of driving? Um, I remember listening to my friend's son complaining that he wouldn't get to do his driving test and drive a car, but it, things don't happen that quickly and, and it's never sort of a black and white one or the other. Um, so it's very difficult to answer that question, but I, would, I wouldn't say it will happen like that. Um, it may potentially improve roads. So if you can track um, roads that need repairing and uh, you know, re reduce the amount of journeys but focus on uh, a concentrated road, um, uh, so that comes down to sort of very smart urban planning, then m potentially it, you know, roads will get better. Um, but that's a hypothesis. Um, yeah, so that's my um, non-answer to your my non-direct answer to your question. Um, but I think it's always interesting to, to think about. I think the other thing to think about, and this is where we just don't know, is the th the surprises that emerge around uh, the adoption of new technology. So one of the surprises in the the business that I was involved in uh, that is still slightly untapped. So the solar home system market, connected devices, uh, remote switch on and off, ongoing payment models is that there's some very valuable data emerging, not only on the uses of the products and the product lifetime, and, um, and, and eventually that's valuable to all sorts of different people, but the, 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 the behaviors and usage uh, of the end users of those devices, and the fact that we now have lots of people that are paying for power uh, and have you know, previously no credit history before. So it's all sorts of value that emerges that we can't quite see at this early stage of adoption of a technology. So, um, you know, that's, I guess that's my point around sort of exploring and, and, and piloting and just recognising that we're in this very early stage. Shall I answer your question now? Please. Okay. <laughs> we had this game, um, uh, and my answer to that, I think, at the moment, um, is uh, my, if I had to put a bet on a technology that's going to be um, uh, a fundamentally cross-cutting uh, and data-led, I would say the blockchain uh, uh, and I think that that is because it, a bit like mobile payments is a sort of infrastructure play that cuts across so many different areas, whether it's um, uh, uh, supply chain logistics or delivery of goods and tracking those delivery of goods in humanitarian context or in any, any context, or whether it's around digital identity and making sure that um, people that are moving around the world or not moving around the world have a known identity stored in a safe place that is... Um, uh, encrypted. Um, so, and, and, you know, I could go on. There are so many potential use cases for it, but what I like about it is, is that it's an infrastructure play that's cross-cutting and, and sort of somewhat democratic, I think, if I can say that. Great. Jonathan, pick a question and answer mine. Ooh, um, uh, regulation. Uh, I, I think, they, obviously, regulation in, in, in Europe... Uh, it's going to differ from country to country. Um, Switzerland is uh, among the most, uh, Finland also, Switzerland and Finland are the most progressive countries in Europe. In Switzerland, you only have to prove um, that you crash your drone with minimal ground impact. Uh, you don't kill the cow. Um, uh, so if you have some braking parachute technologies, that's pretty much all you need to be able to fly over Zurich or, or Geneva. Um, uh, in Germany, they're very, very conservative. So uh, in Africa, I think we're going to look at the Swiss model. Um, it's an important distinction. There's very little civil aviation in most African countries. I mean, a, a country like uh, Ghana has maybe eight to 10 commercial overflights a day. Obviously, there are some smaller bush planes going back and forward, but the sky is pretty, is pretty clear. So I'm pretty optimistic on the, on the regulatory side. Um, in terms of the big technology play coming along, it has to be artificial intelligence. I think uh, AI has 
uh, extraordinary power um, to improve quality of healthcare and, and agriculture. I'm particularly excited about application of AI in not the very smallest farmers, uh, but the, the farmers who have maybe three to five hectares of land. I think um, they will be able to apply fertilizer, water, even think through their crop rotations in a much more um, uh, refined way, probably going to double their outputs in the next decade. So, yeah, AI, definitely. Right. Do you see what I've just done there? I've just basically lured you into two more events at the RSA, one on, <laughs> uh, one on blockchain and one on AI. But what... Uh... But I want one on solar. I mean, to right, me, okay. that, that would be my bet. Um, so if I answer that question first, because off-grid solar is absolutely where I put my money because I can see it being transformative already because, you know, if you're a woman in a village and there's no light, you're having a breech birth, even if you get the health worker to go to the clinic, how can they deliver that with absolutely no light? And, you know, by linking it to the Internet of Things, you can monitor the solar that's being used by health centres in education. If kids, instead of those smoky paraffin lamps, which give you really bad chests, if they actually had light then they could do homework and they wouldn't be failing and failing and failing again every year. And off-grid solar puts an asset into the hands of the community itself. So, you know, that, that's what I'd go for. Um, and I agree about regulation. If anyone's interested, UAVAs have a great database of regulation by country. Um, but the regulation, South Africa, Ghana, Rwanda... It's quite basic. It says you've got to fly your drones within line of sight, most of it, um, and there's a bit about licensing. But the regulation certainly is an area that really needs a lot of serious thought before drones could be used widely. You've been a great audience. I think we should have a bit of audience participation just to end with. So I'm going to ask you to vote on their three nominations for the most exciting technology. So you have to vote for blockchain, AI, or solar. OK, so all those of you think blockchain is the most exciting technology, apart from drones? Ooh, I think that's about 15. 20, or oh, they're going up slowly. 20. Uh, AI? 30. Solar? Oh. <laughs> ah. It's always nice when the sponsor wins. OK. Um, so, sadly, we've run out of time, um, so I'm going to wrap up. Uh, thank you all for coming and for asking such excellent uh, questions. Thanks again to our friends at Crown Agents Foundation. For their generous support this evening's events, do visit their website, which is uh, www.crownagents.com, to find out more about some of the projects and technologies that we've been discussing uh, this evening. So now uh, it just remains for me to ask you to, to join me in thanking our terrific speakers tomorrow, Jonathan and Marie.